helps us realize that we don't have to hang on because we understand that God actually is the giver of all givers. If we give, God will bless us. And I'm going to look at a ton of scriptures that I hope build up your faith in the provincial, no, the provisional heart of God to provide. God provides. He will provide. One of his names, do we know it? Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. That is God's heart. That is his namesake. And when we don't give and exceed our giving, we never actually get in touch with Jehovah Jireh. You're missing out on a whole part of God's heart because you're, you're not stepping out in faith into accepting that grace that he wants to pour over you. But... Hello? Uh, hello, Robert. This is Michael. Uh, we've been missing each other on the phone. Oh, hi there. Um, yes, um, it's concerning the International Christian Church. I'm, I'm sort of looking at your website and okay. studying your materials. I've, I, I listened last night to a sermon um, by, yes. by Michelle Williamson. Yes. Um, she's, it was titled, Money is the Answer to Everything? Yes, that's actually a scripture in Ecclesiastes, yes. <laughs> oh, right. Uh, <laughs> I'll look that up. Um, she said on that, and I, I didn't, I, it was rather quick, so I, it is a bit of a paraphrase. When we don't give, yes. we don't get in contact with Jehovah Jireh. And I was a bit shocked. When we don't give... We don't give in contact with Jehovah Jireh. I, I scribbled it down, and I think there was a little bit more than that. Um, but the yeah. co- context seems to be that we sort of get in contact with God by paying money. And I was a bit shocked, Michael. Uh, I can understand. I can understand that. But that was, that was definitely not what she was trying to say. Um, it's what she all, said. Let me say that I, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted you. Go on, sorry. No, that's okay, that's okay. That's fine, Robert. It's Robert, right? Or is it Wilbur? Robert. Robert, okay, Robert, perfect. Yeah, I got yeah, it right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I wasn't there when she spoke. She spoke, you know, that was on a Wednesday night, and she spoke to the some of the women in the church. But this is what, what I believe, what we believe, that part, just part of being a Christian, right? Well, yeah. Being a Christian is not holding back your heart from God. Right. And that, that is manifested in, in many different ways, right? We, we, sh- we should lay mm-hmm. down our lives for one another. Uh, we serve one another. Uh, we share our faith, uh, you know, to help people to get to know God. And the other thing that also we should not hold back from God is money, meaning being greedy. Uh, so... As Jesus taught, that if we, you know, we need to love Him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Yeah. And that includes pretty much everything. So that in that same category, that includes uh, financial giving. Now, then you have the other side of the coin, which is, you know, whatever is given to the church needs to be used responsibly. And it's to be well documented. And the people that are in the full-time ministry, they do not become rich by being in a full-time ministry. They are there to serve people. And so all the money that we collect, mostly from our members, we do not invest it into buildings or things like that. We invest it into people. So, for example, hiring more people that can be in in the full-time ministry so that we can have a greater impact in the world that we live in. Um, Our finances are open for anyone to look at. But in a nutshell, uh, I I believe that's what Michelle Williamson was trying to say, that, you know, we cannot withhold our heart from God. And one of the ways that we can withhold our heart is by saying, well, uh, I'm not giving. A, I'm not going to give to God sacrificially. What you mean is giving to the church, to your church organization? Well, giving to the church, yeah. Because obviously, we cannot throw money in the air and expect it to flow to heaven, right? 
Well, I think Jesus said, give your money to the poor. Jesus told people to give their money directly to the poor to bypass the religious leaders of his day. The only, the only instance where Jesus um, paid money to religious leaders uh, under Jewish law, one of the offerings was um, each male of a certain age, I forget whether it's 20 or 30, but between the age of about 20 and 60 or 30 and 50, something like that, they had to pay half a shekel to the sanctuary, that's the temple, each year. So Jesus told Peter to go and fish and take a coin out of a fish's mouth, it would have been a shekel, and that's the half shekel for Peter and for himself. Um, fish, fish were exempt from tithing. You only tithed on agricultural produce of the land of Israel. So fish were exempt from tithing. So it's probably um, um, Jesus showing some condemnation and disapproval of the Jewish leaders of his day that's why the, yeah. the, the money was found in the mouth of a fish. But Jesus told us to give our money to the poor. As I understand the New Testament, nobody took a cut. The, the problem with so many churches today is everyone's got their cut. Um, I'm not saying this is true of the international church. I really don't know how your situation is run. But in many churches, if you give £100 to the church, 90% on average in so many churches goes on administration, building, salaries, and pensions. So 10% is then given for good causes, but then even then, they could, the church will say, well, look, um, you know, the trip that we took our kids on, the youth group trip, and the pizzas for the youth group, and this for the youth group, we'll put that down as evangelism, when it's not evangelism at all. So yeah. I'm not saying this is true of the international Christian church, I really don't know. But in so many cases, um, I see churches being run by a plurality of unpaid elders. Acts 14.23 says that Paul says that they appointed elders in every city. Now, if you have churches, small churches, they didn't have mega churches in the New Testament. They met in people's homes. They were small. If you had churches run by three or five men, then in a church of 50 or 60 people with five elders, you can't afford to pay one, yet alone five salaries, five pensions, five free houses, five free mules, and so on and so on and so on. Um, church leaders didn't take a cut. The only thing that they got, as far as I can understand, was um, there was a daily distribution of food. And if you t taught or worked in the church, you went to the front of the queue to get the best food. Widows and orphans would be back at the queue. That was, that was what you got for teaching in the church. If you were a missionary, you could certainly expect financial help. If you left the church and you moved to another part of the world, for instance, if you moved from where you are in England to India to preach the gospel in India, you could expect help. But the general policy was, and it was a brilliant policy, the church will financially help you if you preach to the lost. If you preach to the saved, or you uh, mop the floors of the church for the saved, or you're a singer, or you're an usher, or whatever you do in the church to help people who are saved, then you do it unpaid. And it, it's brilliant, because it means that any money that's, that was donated in the New Testament went to the poor. No one was taking their 90% cut, as you have today. Yeah, and so that's pretty much, in, in a nutshell, Robert, that's how we do it. For example, I'm one of the shepherds in the church. Yes. Or you, or you use the name elder, the same thing. Yes. Uh, I don't get paid by the church. Uh, I have my own job. Um, yes. That I, that I do. And we have other shepherds in the church. We do have people who are focused on the ministry of the word to the lost. And they are out pretty much the whole day in different parts of, in this case, London, because I'm in London. Yes. And it, their time is dedicated to preaching the word, uh, helping people to get to know God, people that do not know God. And I do that as well, but I cannot do it during the day because obviously I'm working. Yes, yes. And so I need to be able to. So the people that we do support financially uh, are the ones that are really fully focused on preaching the word, not to the saved, but to the lost. And other people, uh, myself, my wife, and some other people, we have our own jobs. 
and we have a role of a shepherd, which is taking care of the people in the church. Yes. Taking care of the spiritual needs. Now, of course, doesn't mean we only do that. We do other things as well. Doesn't mean that the people that are uh, paid by the church only preach to the lost. They also help in other areas, but their focus during the day is preaching to the lost. And we do send out many, many mission teams uh, to all parts of the world, whether it's third world or first world. And as you said, those people that dedicate themselves, that fly to other cities, to other countries and cultures and languages to preach the word, uh, we support them. And so that's where our most of our uh, contributions that we give to the church uh, mm -hmm. go to. And of course, there are other expenses, right? Where we meet, yes. um, we need to cover the rent. But that's really... Um, a small part of how we use the finances. Um, is it true that you don't believe that groups that are not baptized by your group, such as Baptists and Methodists and Anglicans, even other members of the Church of Christ, are lost? No, we don't believe that uh, by definition. We do, but we do have our sets of beliefs, obviously, that come from the Bible. But if anyone does it according to how the Bible says it, they are saved, regardless of if they're in our group or not. Right. Um, Mr. Williamson, Michael Williamson, told yep. me that people who were Baptists, attended Baptist churches, and had not been baptized by the International Christian Church were lost. He told me that. Well, as I say again, if they do it according to the Bible... No, the no, no, church, no, 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 not a case of if they do it. Are people who do not attend your church, let's take Baptists... Mr. Williamson yeah. told me, Michael Williamson, the, the pastor of the London church, said that Baptists who do not attend your church, who are not baptized by your group, are lost. They're unsaved, he I'm said. Gonna, I, I'm going to say this. I, I, those are Michael's words. I'm another Michael. I'm yeah, going to sure. say this. If anyone does not do it according to the Bible, and I know you agree with this, they are not saved. So if a Baptist church does not do it according to the Bible, they are not saved. If we do not do it according to the Bible, they are not saved. What, now, what, what, what is according to the me, Bible? What is according to the Bible? What does a person not, have to do to be saved? Tell you what, Robert, why did you come to our church? Are you, do you live in London? No, I live in Plymouth. Okay, where, how far is that from London? I'm not sure if I know where it is. About 200 miles. Oh, you're far away. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's okay, that's okay. I, I moved to London six years ago from from, uh, from the Dutch Caribbean, so I've heard of Plymouth, but I wasn't sure where it was. Mm -hmm. But here, here's the thing, Robert. Um, I don't want to get into a long discussion about these things right now, or to be honest, any time, um, because I feel like it is, it is really not productive. Um, now, if someone wants to sit down and study the Bible and know what we believe, I can show from the scriptures what we believe, yes. But to get into these, let's, for lack of a better word, let's call it debate. Um, I know I can imagine you have things to do, as I have as well yes. to do. Yes, yes. Um, and so for us to get into this, I think we both can use our time in, in better ways. What I do know is that how my life has been changed how I've grown in my faith, how I've grown in my character. I'm a totally different man from how I was before. I see the same happening with many, many people around me. Uh, we deal with sin. Uh, we deal with uh, things in our character that are not like Christ. We love each other. We serve each other. We live in our lives with one another. And in the church, you clearly see uh, what John, what Jesus said in John 13, 30. 5 and 36, by your love for one another, they will know that you are my disciples. And, and how do you love people who leave your group? If a person leaves your group, do you still love them? Do you still well, fellowship we still with love them? them? But everyone has free choice, right? So if someone decides to leave us, we respect that. They're allowed to leave us. But if someone chooses not to have anything to do with us, we respect that. And so... Uh, what else can we do? We do keep in touch occasionally if the people so desire. Some of them come back, some do not come back. But um, we do got to be focused on the people that want to do what's right. But and so if someone decides to leave my group, yes. I respect that. It's not for me to go running after them. But don't you love them? Don't you love people? 
You've just read John 13. That verse commands you to love people, including people who've left your group, who disagree with you. I mean, you're more or less saying to me, you don't want to um, talk to me uh, or dialogue with me. Um, where's the love in that? If, if, if I'm going to go to hell, which is what you're basically saying, I mean, Mr. Williamson, Michael Williamson, said, I asked him, are Baptists safe? And I mean, Baptists who don't, don't attend your church, who are not baptised by you, and he said they're lost, they're unsaved. Well, Robert, why do you, if, if Michael Williamson told you that, right? Right. And, and that's firmly what you disagree with, and I told you something in a different way. Why do you keep coming after us um, to talk to us? I don't understand, because I'm willing to sit well, down. He, 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 he told me that about an hour ago. He phoned me. Someone passed my details oh, okay, on to him. Okay. So it was only okay. an hour ago. Um, but, I mean, you're basically saying that you're it. You're the only Christians on earth, aren't no, you? I, I, mean, have, I mean, even I, the Church of Christ, e e e <laughs> even the traditional Church of Christ. Yeah. E and I met the traditional Church of Christ when I was at university in Aberdeen in the 1990s. And I spoke to one of their leaders and he told me that um, people had come over from America connected with Mr. Kip McKean and they spoke to the traditional Church of Christ here in the UK about whether the, the two groups would be amalgamated and there wasn't an agreement. So the Kit McKean group, of which Kit McKean was thrown out, um, the International Churches of Christ, he's now set up the International Christian Church, um, yeah. they regarded the traditional Church of Christ as lost. And the man, in, 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 it, it was near to Aberdeen, he told me with shock on his face, because we wouldn't submit to these youngsters, you know, kiddies in their 20s and 30s, they regarded us as lost. I mean, you seem well, to be saying that you're you. it. You seem to be saying you are the only Christians on earth. No, Everyone else no. is lost. No, I will never say that. And okay. Kip doesn't believe that either. We believe there are people in our churches that can be lost. There can be people in other churches that are saved. But you have to be a sold out disciple. And you have to be baptized for the good and social sense. If, so, if, you have a, if someone stays lukewarm for too long, then that person eventually loses their salvation. That's very clear in the Bible. So, Robert, I'm going to end it at that. Um, you clearly have your position. Uh, I have my position. I don't think we'll really get anywhere, to be honest. So I do appreciate you reaching out to me. But uh, I think the Bible does talk about uh, getting into useless arguments and things like that. So let's just agree to disagree and take it from there. How can discussing the Bible be a useless argument? If I might just make one brief brief Go suggestion ahead. and then we can finish and thank you for your time sure. um mr hart i do do appreciate it You're welcome, um the bible talks about double imputation the new covenant is not about what we do it's about what god has done to save us the new covenant right. hebrews 9 13 to 15 is a covenant made between god the father and Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ shares his nature of his father eternally. He's eternally Yahweh God, but he's also a man. And this covenant is mediated by the Holy Spirit. So whereas in the old covenant, man broke the covenant, in the new covenant, it's never going to be broken because the covenant's made between God the Father and Jesus Christ. And neither of those are going to break the covenant. So in the new covenant, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. And our sins are imputed to Christ. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with our works or what we do. Second Corinthians 5.21, and I'll finish here. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So that verse says that Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. And earlier on in the same chapter, it says that our sins are imputed to Christ. That's how people are saved in the new covenant. Not by them making decisions about becoming disciples and being baptized in a certain way. Would you think about that? Okay. Okay, Robert. Thank you so much for that. I will keep that in mind. And, okay. Uh, thank you for your time as well. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. All the best, Michael. Bye-bye. Right.